All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out to another talk in our series, Conversations with the Past. Um, I'm Maureen Folk. I'm the Outreach and Program Coordinator here at the Chapman Museum. Tonight, we're very excited to be hearing from Tisha Dolton. Tisha was born and raised in Washington County, uh, where she studied voice, or not where she studied, excuse me. She studied voice performance at Adirondack Community College before transferring to SUNY New Paltz and obtaining her bachelor's in history. In the summer of 1998, Dalton taught herself hand embroidery while working as a seasonal interpretive ranger at Saratoga National Historical Park in Stillwater, New York. She has worked as an, a site interpreter at the Junipero Serra Museum, uh, Villa Montezuma, Marston House, and the San Diego History Center, as well as the Schuyler Mansion State Historic Site in Albany. After nearly nine years as a bookseller, she returned to college and received her master's in information science from the University of Albany. She served as the appointed public historian for the town of Greenwich from 2003 to 2019. She's currently a librarian slash historian at the Folklife Center at the Crandall Public Library uh, right here in Glens Falls and serves as, the as a trustee of the Warren County Historical Society, is a vice regent of the Jane McRae chapter, NSDAR, and is co-founder of the chair of Celebrating Suffrage in Greater Glens Falls Committee uh, which creates and promotes suffrage and women's history events in the region. Her research focuses on suffrage songs, pageants, local Warren and Washington County suffragists, women's clubs, and local minority groups. So without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Tisha for her talk, Red Work Embroidery and the Suffragist Tea Cozy Project. <laughs> So we'll give a shout out to the Warren County Historical Society. It stands over there. He's one of our co he's our one of our co-presidents because they actually published my book um, after the exhibit was at um, the historic or the um, library. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to start out with a song. <laughs> it happened once in England, failed the woman's mind got started. Thinking suffrage routes her share from her unjustly parted. The laws and taxes she should heed, in which she had no say, sir. To her fair thoughts, if false indeed, she cried, will not obey, sir. Votes for women, keep it up, never mind what party. Votes for women, sure to win, sing it strong and hearty. We'll show the world through word and deed by us the vote is wanted. Let legislators now take heed, our courage is undaunted. The struggle waxes fierce and strong, we we'll zeal these women burning. We'll bring the men to all their wrong, all weak traditions burning. Votes for women, keep it up, never mind what party. Votes for women, sure to win, sing it strong and hearty. Two cousins now across the streets from hope is thus imparted. They need no force to set them free. They turn to men true-hearted. But women will in this good land is done before we speak, sir. With loyal word and willing hand, they're given what they seek, sir. Votes for women, keep it up, never mind what party. Votes for women, sure to win, singing strong and hearty. Now that was a suffrage song that was published in 1912. Um, it, it was in the Equal Suffrage Song Sheet, which was a series of 26 songs, um, basically lyrics set to old tunes that people could then sing um, at suffrage meetings and at parades and things like that. So they would hand out um, the new lyrics and people could just sing along because as you probably recognize, it's a tune of Yankee Doodle. <laughs> so most people in the United States would know that, even though Yankee Doodle was originally mocking us during the American Revolution. Um, but the woman who uh, wrote the lyrics to the, that song and all 26 in, in the suffrage song, uh, su suffer equal suffrage song sheet, was um, a suffragist and lawyer named Eugenie Ray Smith. Um, she was from Brooklyn, um, and uh, unfortunately, she died in 1914 before she could get the right to Brooklyn. Um, but she was uh, part of the uh, 
Equal League of Self-Supporting Women, which was an organization founded by um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch, when she came back from England and found that the suffrage movement basically hadn't moved um, in the 10, 15 years she'd been in England. Um, and eventually that organization becomes uh, the uh, Women's Political Union. Um, and their suffrage colors were green, white, and purple. If any of you are familiar with the suffrage movement in the United States, a lot of times you see the yellow, white, and purple. That is the Women's Political Union suffrage colors. Um, that was Alice Powell's organization. So just a little bit of a, a difference there. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, otherwise known as the um, Women's Right to Vote Suffrage. Um, the right to citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any other state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, which was passed in... Anyway? 1940. Anybody know when women got the right to vote in New York? New York, 1917. <clears throat> However, we could vote in school elections in 1880. <laughs> <laughs> and once that happened, um, women are like, well, if we can vote for the school elections, then we can run for school commissioner. So a lot of them ran for the local school boards. Um, so there you do see a big um, push on that. Um, but we have a couple of women here from Albany. Um, this is Susan Smith and her daughter Mary Smith Williams. And this is, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is Sarah Smith. This is Susan W. And this is her daughter Mary Williams. That's correct. Um, and they were um, three of the first known African American women to actually register to vote in Albany in 1880 and voted in the school board election in 1880. <clears throat> and luckily enough, their pictures were available. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, a woman in uh, Schenectady, Julie O'Connor, who does a lot of um, research into uh, suffragists in, in Albany. Um, and uh, I follow her blog, so I got the pictures. They were actually published in a book about um, uh, Mary um, Williams was um, was a teacher, and she taught at the Wilbur Wilberforce School in Albany, which was a black school. Um, and uh, they were all very active in um, uh, abolition um, as well as suffrage, um, equal rights in general in in Albany and uh, New York City. <clears throat> So 1880, New York State women get the right to vote uh, in school board elections. Um, 1885 is really important. Uh, Mary Anthony, Susan B. Anthony's sister, uh, founds the first political equality club in Rochester. Uh, and with that founding, there's a big push by the Anthony sisters and by other um, folks to form these political equality clubs, suffrage study clubs, um, to basically teach women about voting because they hadn't been able to vote. So some of them didn't know what it was about, how important it was. Um, so they created these clubs and they um, went around the state, New York State, um, and uh, went to local communities and tried to um, garner support and get these um, organizations up and started. And one of the first, um, actually the first in our area was the Easton Political Equality Club in Easton in Washington County. Um, we have a couple of ladies here. This is Chloe Sisson and this is Lucy Allen. Um, and they were the two main founders of the Easton Political Equality Club. They were actually students of Mary and Susan, and Susan B. Anthony. Um, uh, if any of you know, Mary Anthony was actually born in Battenville um, when the Anthony family moved from Adams, Massachusetts to the town of Greenwich um, for uh, Daniel Anthony to run the mill. Um, Mary was born in 1827. Susan was born in Adams, Massachusetts in 1820. So she was six years old when they moved to Greenwich. Um, so they um, they became teachers. Um, the older sister Wilma became a teacher. I'm not sure about Hannah. 
Um, but at least three of the four sisters um, that survived to adulthood became teachers and they taught in this area. They had a lot of former students um, and they would come back and visit. They saw family and friends um, in the areas. So they would come back here quite frequently, um, not just um, for the suffrage cause, but also for, um, you know, just being with friends and family. Um, but they convinced some ladies that it was important to form these political equality clubs. And at one point in time, Washington County had 11 political equality clubs. So they were, uh, Washington County in particular was very active. Warren County, not as much. Um, as far as I can tell, we only had two, one here in Lens Falls and one in Lake George. Lake George was specifically called, what was called well, at the time, was um, a study club. Um, and a lot of the women who were in the Glens Falls political club were also in the Lake George club. Um, uh, if anybody knows of um, Elmer Rest and his brothers, um, there were three brothers, and all three of their wives were um, active in, um, in suffrage, and they were part of the um, both political equality clubs here in Glens Falls and in Lake George. <clears throat> so 1891, Easton forms the Political Equality Club. In 1894, there's a constitutional convention here in New York. Does anybody know what a constitutional convention is? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So they decide every so many years that they're going to possibly amend the, the New York State Constitution. And so they have these constitutional amendments to try to figure out what's going to be brought up for possibility, what might pass. Um, and there are different delegates that go to these things. Um, so one of the things that gets brought up for the 1894 Constitutional Convention is whether women can have the right to vote. So whether that suffrage amendment is going to be added to the Constitution. So we actually had a number of people here. Um, Glens Falls had formed um, the political body club by that time. Um, and they send um, messages to the uh, folks in favor of you know, getting the delegates to pass the Constitutional Convention. Um, to uh, three such ladies, uh, Mrs. Eva L. King, um, Mrs. Anna Saylor, and Mrs. Franny DeVol um, all issued a proclamation um, at the Baptist Church um, here on Maple Street. Um, and their uh, statement was, whereas we citizens of Warren County and Mass meeting assembled believe that justice and the principle upon which our government is based demand the enfranchisement of women. Therefore, resolved that we urge the members of the Constitutional Convention to submit an amendment striking the word male from Article 2, Section 1 of the State Constitution. Resolved that we especially urge the members of the convention rep representing the 21st Senate District, which was our district at the time, um, namely Chester B. McLaughlin, Charles H. Moore, Edgar A. Spencer, Frederick Fraser and Thomas W. MacArthur to vote for such an amendment and thus secure to the women of the state full political rights. And as we know, that did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very active in doing that. So there was a big push around 1894. Um, so political equality clubs that had formed in, in 1891, 1892, 1893 were very active. Lens Falls Club was active for a couple of years and then it kind of died down um, for a little bit <clears throat> until 1915 when the state says, we're gonna put it to a vote to the male voters. No constitutional convention. They're gonna send it right to the male voters. So once they announced this in 1914, um, a bunch of the more stagnant clubs, including Lens Falls, gets back up and running. Um, and there's a lady here um, uh, where Morgan and Company is. That's the house of um, okay. the McEachern house, yes. Behind that house where the apartment building is, there was another house, and that was their daughter, their daughter's house. And her daughter, Catherine, Catherine Bowden, um, was the impetus in uh, getting the political equality club back up and running. And luckily, some of those ladies were still alive, <laughs> um, including two of the founders of the original Political Equality Club, and they were also the founders of the uh, first study club in the area, and that was um, Susan Bain and Anna Murray. Um, they formed Friends in Council, which was a study club, and they were Quakers. 
1881. They helped form the Political Equality Club in 1894, and they were very active when the club reformed in um, 1914. Um, Anna Murray unfortunately dies within a couple of years, so she does not um, she does not get to vote. Um, but this Anna Murray, she was a teacher here in the <clears throat> She was also very active in um, the Mother's Club, which was um, a club set up to help um, mothers uh, care for their children. Um, there was a big push at the time for um, uh, clean milk because there was issues with milk being um, having bacteria and things, you know, eventually lead into pasteurization. Um, <clears throat> But they were, she was very active in, in that organization. They even um, created um, uh, an all day affair where they had doctors and nurses and um, different educators and show, showed mothers how to uh, properly care for their children. Um, another woman who was active in both the Mother Club and um, the, woman, uh, the Political Equality Club was one of our first female doctors. This is Dr. Annetta Barber. Um, she had a place over here, Westgate. The little, the little white house on the corner, I believe that was her office. Um, she was um, born in the Chazy area, so near Plattsburgh. Um, she, uh, I've been doing quite a bit of research on her. I actually heard from um, a teacher in Queensbury and they um, set up uh, groups every year for like whatever grade it is. There's groups within the grade, and they have names for the groups. And they decided one of their groups was going to be named after Dr. Barber. So he called me and was like, Do you have? Because the picture that he was able to come up with was by T. Cozy. <laughs> 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 Which I have to say was based on a very, not very good newspaper uh, photograph from her obituary. <laughs> and which, as you can tell, I did not see her eyes. In, in, so it was just easier just to do the classes. Um, this was the, um, the obituary. Um, now, if I actually like open, cracked open uh, one of the Images of America books about people in Lens Falls, I would have found this picture, which is here at the Chapman. <laughs> so this it will be re <laughs> Dr. Annetta Barber. Um, but uh, like I said, she was from Jay-Z. She was born in 1859. Um, she, her mo mother was uh, Elizabeth Van Tyne, her father, George F. Barber. Um, her, her father was married three times. Um, so there are black, black kids. Um, she has, two brothers, um, four brothers, and then quite a few half-brothers and, and such. Um, but Dr. Barber was active in both late, local, state, and national medical associations, women's clubs, as I mentioned, civics organizations. She was a founding member of Santa. Um, believing that women should have the right to vote, she was active in the political equality club from about 1902 to 1917, because women get the right to vote in 1917. I am like <laughs> Uh, Dr. Barber presented a number of papers at medical conferences and at women's organizations based on her research. One was titled, What the World Owes to the Scientific Discovery of Medicine and Surgery. Um, she was, a, like I said, a charter member of Zanta. She was also very active in the Tri-County Association for the Blind. Um, during the Depression, she was president of the Family Welfare Association and led campaigns to get donations of new and used toys for children in need. The toys were actually taken to the fire department and the fire department would actually repurpose them. So like if, you know, they needed to be repainted, like if they were little wooden trucks or something like that, they would repaint them, they would clean things. Women would sew stuffed animals back together, restuff them. As we remember, we're talking about the depression, so it um, uh, wasn't necessarily as uh, able people weren't necessarily able to buy new to, new toys like we do today. Um, Dr. Barber never married, but remained close to her family, who she would visit often. Um, in the 1915 census, it's listed that she adopted a daughter named Dorothy Barber, which I'm trying to find um, more information on, but I haven't been able to find it. 
1942, she sold her house on Notre Dame Street and retired to the Glens Falls home for aged women on Warren Street near where I live. <laughs> um, she died um, in late April of 1945 in Ogdensburg and is buried at the Riverview Cemetery in her hometown of Chasey. There's also another, there were two other um, female doctors in this area, um, but the other one who was active in the suffering movement was uh, Dr. Amelia Wright, and I don't have a picture of her, so I did not embroider her. So, um, 1915 was the big push to, um, Basically, they, the, the suffragists get together and they um, canvass the entirety of Glens Falls. So they set up, um, uh, one of the husbands owns um, Adirondack Electric and Power on Ridge Street. And so they set up their campaign um, office there um, and everybody is assigned a different ward. So they go to the different wards that they canvass, both men and women to see kind of where the baseline is for, for suffrage. Um, and, then it comes to the night of polls, and a reporter asks if goes around and asks if, if they're going to do poll watching. You know, um, so the at this time, Mrs. Hodgson is the president of the Political Equality Club, um, and she says that they're not going to poll watch. They're just going to, you know, they did all their canvassing. They're going to sit back and see what happens. And then our anti suffrage group, because we had one, <clears throat> which was uh, run by, um, her name is uh, Jeanette Bruce Davis. Her husband was Loyal L. Davis. They would actually divorce a few years later. Um, <laughs> and his obituary, I kid you not, is like the entire mm -hmm. length of the paper and then goes around and it's like two more columns on another side. And her obituary is like this big in a Connecticut newspaper because she goes to live with her daughter in Connecticut. And I'm like, dude, she was a teacher. <laughs> it's not like she didn't do anything. But he, like Loyal Davis, like was in like every fraternal organization in Glens Falls you could possibly imagine. Like, I didn't even know there were this many organizations in here, like for men or women together. And so on, so on. Like every office he ever like held within the organization, it was, it's the same. Um, and there's a picture for, of him, not her. <clears throat> so Mrs. Loyal Davis is, is asked um, if they're going to poll watch. Their organization is the Glens Falls Association opposed to women's suffrage. And she says, quote, if the time ever comes when women vote, then we will go to the polls. But until that time comes, we will remain away. And that is very true with many of the anti-suffrage women. They weren't going to vote. They weren't going to uh, they were against suffrage, but once they got suffrage, they were going to vote because they wanted to make sure that their opinions were heard. <clears throat> so in 1915, as you can probably guess, uh, it, suffrage does not get passed in New York. Um, so then there's another push in 1917 for the 1917 referendum. Um, our our anti-suffrage ladies kind of disappear. Um, I don't really see much going on with them in the newspapers. Um, a lot of my research is done for the newspapers because the only political equality club in the area that we found records for are Easton because their organization still exists today as the Easton Book Club. And there's a few records left from the Fort Edward um, organization because this lady, Laura Shaver Porter, who was um, an artist, and was actually one of the first people to um, do art therapy. Um, she saved some of the records because she was involved in that organization. And they're helping with the, um, the Fort House. <clears throat> so, um, so anti-suffrage organization doesn't appear to be doing much, um, at least not organized. Um, and, but our club is still, is still active and they do more of the same canvassing and, and um, then Washington County passes um, the referendum. Um, Warren County does not pass the referendum, but Glens Wells does vote in favor of it. Uh, but all across the state, um, 
it evens out and eventually uh, improvements have just passed in 1917. Okay, it's November 6th. <laughs> uh, this, uh, back when I had more money and, and, and could actually buy a couple of things on eBay, um, most of my things are not like Glens Falls related, but this one I would have had to get because most Glens Falls monthly is only 10 bucks. Um, but it has a Glens Falls customer. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's Frank, yeah, it's Frank Jimmy, um, 34th Street, um, here in Glens Falls. He actually worked for Finch County. Um, and this was sent to him, and it was, you were invited to attend an anti-suffrage mass meeting at City Hall of Glens Falls on Saturday evening, May 15th at 8 o'clock. Miss Lucy F. Price of New York will present arguments against women entering politics, admission free, no collection. So Lucy Price was an anti-suffrage, um, anti-suffragist that, um, she was actually from Ohio. I say New York because she moved to New York, but she's actually from Ohio. Um, but she was she was young and she was pretty and she was um, she spoke really well. So she actually in 1915 made the rounds um, as other suffrage speakers were talking were um, were coming around. They were sending anti suffrage speakers out, and you could find um, different uh, bits of her speeches reported on in different papers like the Placid Views um, here in Glen um, and all around. Um, yeah, she was a pretty popular speaker. And unfortunately, they talk about how beautiful she was. And I found like three or four pictures in the newspaper, and they're all crappy pictures. <laughs> it's like one of them has like half her face missing. And I was just like, oh, that was an unfortunate tear in the newspaper right there. Um, it's the one of them she has that, her, you know how sometimes they wear their hats really low on their heads? So her, the hat is so low on her forehead that you can barely see her face. And then, but the three older ladies that are next to her, you can see plain as day, but you can't, you can't see her. So, oh well. <clears throat> So 1917, um, the male voters um, passed women's suffrage here in New York. Um, then um, it was a couple more years of, um, of battling until we finally get the passage of the suffrage amendment in 1920. So in 2020, that was the 100th anniversary. So what I basically did was I tried to um, combine my love of written work embroidery with my love of the suffrage movement. <laughs> and I um, submitted a grant proposal to LARAC for their um, individual artist grant program and received a grant so that I could um, buy the materials and um, do the research uh, and enlist the help of my mother to sell the tea cozies together. <laughs> um, and created, initially it was going to be 40 suffragists, but at the last minute, I, I discovered two more um, from the help of some uh, gentlemen locally. Um, so I added um, two, so one of being 42, and that's how many were in the book. Um, I have since done more. <laughs> one of these days, I'm going to have to learn how to get a tea cozy myself. <laughs> um, but I have a couple of the new ones here as well. And then a couple that aren't finished yet. Um, so one of the um, one of the ones that got added at the last minute. Um, does anybody know Bob Bale from here? Mm -hmm. So his aunt was a suffragist, and so he gave me this great photo, this really beautiful liner shot of his aunt. Um, she was quite stylish. Um, his uncle owned a department store here in town, and um, I actually found a couple of. Um, um, advertisements in the paper where she was touting basically she could help um, be like a personal stylist if you came into the store and requested her. Um, so she did that. Unfortunately, Bob never met her because she passed away, I think, the year before he was born. And so he knew um, his uncle's second wife, who was his housekeeper. Um, and so that's who, who he grew up knowing. But he did have this wonderful. Um, photographs of this design. That's Bob Bell's aunt, Adley. <laughs> Where was the store that she worked at? Mm -hmm. Um, it was it was Bales. It was um at the bottom of what the mill is now. Oh, okay. That was that was the store, and then it went in. Then it became a factory. And that's that building's been something. I know. <laughs> I like started to lose track, and it was just like. 
Uh, honestly, in Buttswell, so many of his buildings have been so many different things. You're just like, I can't get you on screen. Um, so, you may recognize a couple of them, hopefully. Some of you are not, I mean, not so much. Um, but now, so for the truth, you can take them with us. They're only bad, but they're okay. I have already turned them pink. <laughs> this is Harriet Tubman, a friend of mine. We just went to um, Harriet Tubman's house in Auburn. <laughs> Mom's like, I never want to touch one of these again. Just stay away. <laughs> together in the hot shot is that everyone's whole world is where my exhibit went up in October 2020 in the library. So of course, you know, nobody gets to see them um, until the next year. <laughs> we're closed. Um, we wound up putting up an exhibit um, online instead um, because we had to make some modifications. Um, and that was part of the grant too because that had to be um, publicly accessible to as many people as possible. Um, let's see. Mary. 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 So this is called Red Word of Is it something you invented? No. Oh. Um, I chose it for, uh, well, I love it because red's my favorite color. So when I discovered Red Word in like, 2001, um, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's only red. I was so excited. Um, you know, I knew what I that was. Um, but a lot of the red work patterns um, that were popular uh, from about 1880 uh, <laughs> uh, from about 1880 to about 1940 was the height of its popularity. Um, and they tended to be like, you know, kittens and flowers. Yeah, exactly. And it was uh, what's, what's called surface embroidery. Um, and uh, they would um, sell it in some, you know, like you, if you got a, would sell subscriptions in a magazine, they would, if you got you know, so many new subscriptions, they would send you a free, uh, free patterns or you could go through the pattern book and choose certain ones for free. And so women would get them that way. And I've always done it right now. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, so right here is three stitches. Most of these only have one. Some of them have uh, two. Um, but it's uh, back, uh, a stem stitch uh, or outline stitch, depends on which way the thread is going. Um, and then uh, on, uh, on Harriet, there are um, some uh, French knots. I just learned how to do a couple of years ago. Right. And then uh, the lazy daisy, but I didn't I didn't embellish them that way, so there aren't lazy daisies after that. Um, but it's those three stitches that are sorry, this one's been on the way around. Yeah, so does the color red have do you have symbolism? Not with the suffrage movement. Actually, the, the anti-suffragists were the one with the red roses. But um but red work was really popular during the time period, the, the biggest push for suffrage. So it was like that's why I felt like it was um something that could be used. Um I chose tea cozies because the suffragists um had a couple of connections with tea. Um, one was that they called back to the, the Boston Tea Party when taxation without representation is akin to tyranny. Um, uh, in fact, uh, if you go to Susan B. Anthony House, they talk about how Mary Anthony, because the Susan B. Anthony House in Rochester, um, the mother owned the house. When, um, when the Anthony family basically went bankrupt in the panic of 1837, they lost the mill, they lost the house there in Battenbeck. Um, they had to sell all their clothes and toys and everything. So um, Lucy's, Lucy Anthony's uh, brother wanted to give them land, but he couldn't until 1848 when New York State passes the first married woman's property law. And it becomes the blueprint for the entire country. 
Um, so in 1848, he is finally able to give her the land and the house that they have, that eventually have in Rochester because it cannot be, by then, Daniel Anthony still has debts. He hasn't paid. It's only been 11 years. Um, and they can finally have a house again because it can't be sold out from underneath her to pay for his, his debts in the business. Um, so when she dies, the house goes to Mary Anthony. Susan's out gallivanting all over, doing suffrage speeches and everything. And Mary is actually the first um, female principal um, in schools in Rochester. And she actually yeah, is the first one to get equal pay of male principals in the Rochester School District. That's one of the big things that the Anthony's fight for early on is the equality pay thing. That's kind of what brings Susan into the suffrage um, fold, is her realizing she's not getting paid the same as other male teachers, their male teachers. Um, so at the Anthony House, they'll tell you that, um, so Mary would write her tax check and he, she would always write in the, in the memo that, you know, no taxation without representation. <laughs> so she was a little bit of a spitfire. I actually love Mary. She was my favorite Anthony. She was very fun. Um, so uh, over here are two of the newest ones. Um, the exhibit, um, after I left the library, um, I did a couple of pop-up events. And um, I had like a brief exhibit, a two week um, exhibit of some of the TCOs at the YWCA in Schenectady uh, for Women's History Month um, two years ago. Um, and then um, Tawny, which is traditional arts in upstate New York and Canton, they had it for last, uh, this past um, March. Um, and so I did, I put a, I met a couple of the, um, local historians up there when I went to um, a history conference. And out of, the, out of the three of them, two of them got back to me with pictures of their suffragists. So these two ladies are from St. Lawrence County. This is um, uh, Mary and Frank, and this is Helen Rich. Um, Mary was from Augensburg, and Helen was from Bridgeville. Bridgeville is there. <laughs> 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 it's it's tiny. They both have um they both have markers, <laughs> historic markers. And I'm driving. I'm, I left I uh, left the um uh, the what the heck is it? My daughter and I were driving around, and we had we had just gotten done with dinner. I think and we were driving around. And we're like, Let's see if we can find this marker. And we're driving, and we're like, that car. It was like <laughs> looking really derelict. Um, and then there's just this random marker, like right before a bridge. It's like right there, like one of those little bridges that they're going to have to over thing. Um, and it was really high up. Like, I don't know if they have like a lot of trucks going through there or something, but it's like sometimes the markers are like fairly like low and like short people can take pictures. But I was like, I can't wait to take a picture. <laughs> so yeah, those are those um, two ladies that got included. <clears throat> Um, I have a couple that I'm working on. This is um, Mary Lattimore. She's from um, Albany. Um, she and her husband were friends with um, uh, some people up here. They eventually moved to um, the world for a while. Um, her husband Benjamin, we believe, worked at one of the hotels in the church at one point. Um, they, for a while, lived near Solomon Northwood, um, back in the came back from the war from the slaves, slavery. Um, this is uh, Anna Buckman Kearns. Um, she was a Long Island suffragist. Um, I think we uh, go to the New York State Museum. Sometimes they have the suffrage wagon on display. Um, and she um, and her husband and her daughter um, pulled the and rode in the suffrage wagon um, and suffered parades and this like that. <clears throat> and this is. <laughs> Lydia. I'm like, it's not Lucretia Ma, it's her cousin. <laughs> um, 
Um, this is Lydia Mott. Um, she was um, very active in the Albany um, suffrage movement and abolition movement. She was a Quaker. Um, she was the sister of James Mott, who well, his husband, his wife, um, Lucretia Mott, was one of the uh, Declaration of Senator Falls. She was she and her sister Martha were up and right and Clintech uh, and Hunt and was engaged in did um she was a, what? I couldn't hear that. Oh sorry. <laughs> McClintock Hunt, Martha Cop and Wright, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton did um Senate Proposals, created the Senate Proposals Convention in 1848. Okay, yeah, the names there. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um Rosalie Jones. She was another women suffragist. They called her the general. Um she actually led um, two big marches, um, one from New York City to Albany, um, in which the suffrage wagon was used, and Edna Buckman Kearns and her husband Wilmer and her um, daughter, um, participated. Um, and then she also led um, a march from New York City to um, Washington, D.C. Um, and they March there in 1913. Both of these were in 1913. Um, because they were marching on the way down. If anybody's seen the movie um, Iron God Angels, um, they were marching down for the suffrage parade and pageant that happened the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, um, which then caused a riot. She looks like she had laid a march. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was, uh, she was a spitfire. There was a, they have, they put up a, a marker or two down in, in Long Island. I'm not sure where on Long Island um, she's from. Do you draw these designs first and then stitch them? So, what I do because I can't draw. <laughs> I take a cup and I draw on it and then I make a pattern. Okay. Yeah. But how do you get from the white material to the tea cozy? That's that material that you just showed us that yep. you're working on right now. It's mm -hmm. not this material, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it is. It yeah. doesn't look like it. Yeah. Um, there's some of this. Um, I've started using um, uh, a different. The, the last cone of cotton I got previously was too tight of a weave and was really hard to poke through. Um, so this next kind of cut I got was much nicer, so I've been using that instead. Um, a lot of these are just straight up muslin from Joanne's 399 yard, because cheap. <laughs> 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 I money from my hobbies. So um, part of the reason why they're looking at what my washer needed to be clean, I think. <laughs> um, and so the last time I washed them, um, Rosalie was a new one, um, and we had to wash them, and I washed them with another one that I had made um, for my sister, um, which was Alice Lee, who was from West Point, but eventually then moved to San Diego. My sister was living in San Diego for a bazillion years, um, and she and her partner were actually the first um, recognized gay couple in San Diego um, and traveled in um, the big name circles. Um, circles. Uh, and lived together and everything um, in you know the early 1900s. And so I sent that out to her um, for, she was gonna use it as a donation for um, a fundraiser for her, the ones of ours that she's in. So I had did a little bit of a different fabric, but it's a fabric that even washed before. So um, I'm not quite sure what happened this time, <laughs> but I threw them all in together thinking, oh, I'll just wash them all. And I threw them all in and then a bunch of them, a couple of bunch of them came out with like little pink specks and some of them came out with like the yellowy kind of spots on them. And so I'm like, I'm gonna have to tee that in the origin. Um, and then the pink ones, my mom, <laughs> people were telling my mom to do this and do that and then, 
And my mom was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Why would I do that? And one of them she followed, and that's when they turned pink. <laughs> she called me and asked, she's like, which shoe do you want me to try this with? <laughs> and I was like, I guess these two. And she's like, okay. There's a product called Color Out that you don't use once they're pink, but mm -hmm. when you wash them at the beginning, it soaks up all that extra red dye. My daughter looked at me and was like, did you not, did, didn't you use a color guard? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't have any. She's like, well, I have some. I'm like, well, you're in college. That was not a <laughs> I did one, um, if you go on the Full Life Center's YouTube channel, um, they filmed me, um, Kevin filmed me doing one from start to finish. Um, and it took about four hours. But that's start to finish. Most of the time, I can't. I can't. I can't sit in the library and write for four hours. <laughs> Otherwise, I would never leave there ever. Still be there right now. I'd be like, oh, we're in peace. Um, but yeah. So four hours is the quickest, probably for for something like this. And then this can take more like eight or ten. Um, I have I've done bigger bigger portraits with more intimacy that take a little bit longer. If I have to do words, it takes me even longer. I hate words. Um, <laughs> I initially done um, a couple of prototypes, and this is Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, Reverend Dr. Anna Howard Shaw. Um, and yeah, that's the reason why I don't. I don't put their names. Because <laughs> somebody's like, why don't you put their names on the little? <laughs> Some people love it. I hate it with passion. Uh, and I try, I try to like do it like I'm like, okay, if I do it as cursive, then it's like a continual thing. Still hate it. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what I do. But I do, I do. Um, uh, I have little um, bios of the people that are also in the book. Um, so when somebody buys them, they get they get that as well. So they know who they're who they're purchasing and their little like life history kind of thing. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. How do you pick the fabric that's on the back? Huh. So my sister in San Diego mm -hmm. loves to like shop when she has money um, and loves to like thrift things and things. And she randomly sent me for my birthday one year um, eight and a half yards of this um, poly cotton blend, basically, I think from the bicentennial. So it's like 1970s fabric. Um, so yeah, don't put these in the microwave. This is probably the thing. They are in the back of the fabric and they will, it will melt. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, she sent me this crazy amount of. And it, it, it works because it has the Declaration of Independence on there as you know, the preamble to the Constitution will you know, figures on it. Um, so it was like, that's perfect. It works. And it was the same amount. And it was definitely enough for okay, 42 people. Yes, Dan. I can't believe you have a question after all the times you've seen me. <laughs> no, I thought. You alluded to drawing on a picture and then mm -hmm. transferring it. Yep. And I think if I were new to the spread work stuff, I'd say, how'd you get it from the picture to the fabric to follow? So what I do is I either use a window or a light box. Yeah, so window. Yep, I take it on a window a lot because I do I do now have actually have a light box. It's big enough, but my light box at home when I live with my mom, my light box was like this big and it really wasn't very big. But um, I have a much bigger light box. But like sometimes it's just easier to just do it right now. You can yeah. get it right at your level. Tape it on. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I use I do the pencil when I draw on it. Yeah. And some shameless advertising. Sure. You mentioned that you had biographies of these ladies in the book. What else do you have? Oh, the patterns. I do have and the patterns are in the book. So all 42 ladies are in the book. The patterns are perforated, so you can even take them out. Um, or you can take a copy. Um, and uh, I have extra patterns of different subregions that I have done on this one. Um, and there's posters. If you buy a book, you can just take it because I had, I was selling the rate. I thought I had, I, I ordered a hundred posters 
They sent me way more than because <laughs> because I had my daughter count them one day and I was she's like she's like mom I stopped around three hundred so I don't know why I don't know if they it was just like one of those print run things where they just wind up printing more than and then it's like where are you gonna send this lady because nobody else is gonna want these <laughs> so I have a lot of posters so if you if you buy a book. <laughs> Mother, did you have your hand up or are you just rubbing your eyes? So the the last the last one I am writer, uh, I made a joke on them because I, I post things on on Instagram. And I made a joke, I was like, so should I wait until my mother comes back from her trip to finish to bring put these in a tea cozy or should I learn it through it myself? And so many of my friends are like, ha ha. <laughs> I do have a sewing machine. I do, I do have a little printing yeah, we'll print that, says the table. that I don't know how to put on the sewing machine. <laughs> so one of these days I actually don't have to so I can sew a straight line. Does anyone else have any questions? Sure. First of all, I, I'm just amazed at your handiwork and your artistry and what you've done. So thank you very much for sharing that. But I have an interest in the history of the women because that whole suffrage century was so volatile. I mean, you had labor rights, children's rights, women's property rights, voting, temperance, war, settlement of the West. And women were involved in all of those things. Did the suffragists collaborate with women who were involved, for example, in child labor movements. Yes. In the city. Yep. Different um different organizations were more active in different things. Mm -hmm. Um I mentioned um Harriet Stan Flash and her organization. They were very active in um working class women's rights. Um one of the things that um, she felt very strongly about was that the movement wasn't going to go anywhere if it just and it had, like, like I said, it was pretty stagnant, but she came back from England in 1911. Um, and while she was in England, she'd actually been studying, um, she actually wrote a book about um, women in England at the time. Um, and she knew that the, the movement wasn't gonna go anywhere, it just stayed a bunch of upper middle class white ladies. Um, it needed to embrace, um, the immigrant population you need to play, embrace um, the black population. It needed to um, embrace the class mm -hmm. um, people, which had kind of been um, ignored for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so her organization was very active in, in getting factory workers in particular um, involved um, in supporting their strikes and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Western states were more out to um, give women the vote to her earlier. Um, there's a couple of reasons. One, um, it was kind of seen as more egalitarian because um, they there was less people and they needed everybody down about on the farms and the ranches and everything. So they, women were kind of proving themselves. Um, the other thing was is that in order to um, achieve statehood, you had to have a certain number of voters, of citizens. And so if they granted women citizenship and voting rights, they could count themselves at a higher population. Um, so that's one of the other reasons why they think places like Wyoming were more apt to um, give women the right to vote in 1869. So they could come state. Thank you. Just I got uh, real quick, let's thank Tisha for, for her friend. <laughs> And then feel free to linger and chat if you have more questions or come here and purchase a book. Get a poster. <laughs> <laughs> but 